Ufa, good grief. Freaking high humidity aside and a wild antics galore. They certainly did go all out. Hello, everybody. And yes, it is late at night and I'm tired, but I decided to do this anyway. My name is Noah Foster. I am just a simple man and a lifelong fan of wrestling. Welcome once again to another episode of AEW Spark, the forum that discusses all things, all elite wrestling. As I come to you now with my brief thoughts and outtakes from AEW All Out and previewing this week's episode of AEW Dynamite. With that, let's just go ahead and get right into it. The buy-in featured two matches. I'm glad the two finale was not part of it. I felt it deserved to be on the main card. Opening match was Serpentico versus Joey Janela. Uh, pretty good back and forth action. Serpentico really has developed his own identity and momentum, it seems, ever since teaming up with Looper. Whoever thought you'd see those two as a duo. And they're very effective on Dark, but here, Joey Janela, like he did pull the win out at the end with the scissors from Sunny Kiss, stopping Looper from the outside. Big Evil drop for the win. Uh, following this, though, much more fast-paced, but really good match, I might add, for 10 to 15 minutes they were given. As Private Party, Mark Kwan as they had cast, they took on three and four of the Dark Order, in John Silver and Alex Reynolds, the duo, I might add, that has yet to get a tag team victory until they had their match on AEW Dark. Uh, these two from uh, Dark Order, despite the Dark Order gimmick, uh, I'll talk more about that later. Really good match, great potential as a tag team, great fast and forward uh, frenzy uh, action. Whoops. I don't know how that happened, but whatever. <laughs> Break back and forth, uh, frenzy action, and uh, I might add, I was uh, really impressed with uh, these two. And I don't know why that happened, but whatever. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> sorry, my TV keeps flickering out. I'm having Wi-Fi issues and power issues galore here. Good grief! Why did you work already? There we go. That gum. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Really great back and forth match. In the end, three and four came super close. There was some great tag team offense. Moves for moves, counters for counters. Stacked on top of each other, it uh, seemed. But uh, in the end, Isaiah Kwan and uh, Mark Cassidy, they uh, did get the win. So really good uh, victory uh, for them. As we move into the actual show now that started, and good grief, it was it's hot here, and apparently it was hot there. Humidity and 90 degrees. Kudos to everybody that competed there. We open up all out with literally the two finale match. Uh, I guess you could say a bit of a cinematic taste that it did take place outside the uh, squared circle. But in the end, it was fun in the dance office as uh, Reba, of course, introduced uh, Big Swell in the lobby and then got her head taken off. We saw how vicious, mean, dangerous, and somewhat maniacal that Dr. Britt Baker DMD could be at the dance office with a blade chair and a Baker shirt with blood everywhere, and we just see her in a corridor off to the side. As Big Swell looks around the offices, she opens up an office, finds a bunch of chattering teeth, and then things really picked up from there as uh, Britt Baker and Big Swell, they uh, got it on. Literally, there were uh, certificates used as weapons here, and we had a dumpster spot where Reba ended up going to the dumpster, but Reba ended up giving a crutch to uh, Britt Baker, gave her the advantage halfway through the match, and by the way, went outside the dentist's office too, during a portion of this, in a Rolls Royce, and then went back in. We had all sorts of dental tools used here, including that uh, spritzer you get in your uh, mouth by Reba, not very effective. Uh, dental drill, well not dental drill, but a real drill, it looked like uh, Britt Baker was trying to take out literally Swole's teeth, the hard way, damn. And then uh, following that, it looks like she was going to put her under, or at least, you know, uh, as she tried, yes, we had a syringe spot. And uh, in the end, Big Swell got the better of Brit in this spot and stuck the syringe in her leg, which I imagine was full of, like, morphine that literally numbed her leg in place. Sometimes my right leg literally goes down me for sitting a long period of time. Anyway, as this uh, match continued, in the end, Big Swell used, I have to imagine, laughing gas. And put Britt Baker under just long enough for the ref to literally drop the arm one time, I might add, and ring the bell from wherever. And the match was over. Big Swole won. A very fun, different outlook for AEW's women's division, I might add. A first in the women's division, as Tony Khan, Kenny Omega, Dustin, and a camera crew were all there just for this match. And I'm glad the executive decision was made to add this onto the main card. It was a really fun opener, and I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, Big Swell won, so uh, I have to imagine Big Swell will be in line for a future uh, AEW Women's World title opportunity. 
And as far as uh, Britt Baker, I'm sure she's upset, but hell of a performance by her. I don't know necessarily how 100% her leg is, especially after that shot. And uh, we'll see what's next for the uh, good doctor. But still, I really enjoyed uh, this match. Great opener. As we uh, move on from there, we go back to uh, Daly's place, where, of course, they were at 10% capacity. And we get into our other matches. And our next bout was our opening bout. It was Young Bucks versus Jurassic Express. Really great, fast, forward frenzy action by all four members here and literally dinosaurs can fly not just pterodactyls luchasaurus literally coming off the top rope planning into the audience at ringside for the faces i might add and the young bucks literally showing a new um side of them it seems much more aggressive side even taking out marco stunt who tried to come in play earlier but they double super kicked that little guy out of play uh, ridiculous uh, Canadian Destroyer spot by Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy, there are many near falls, close moments here, but in the end, uh, BTE triggered not once, but twice. So basically, two double kick, super kick spots. It did give Young Bucks the win. So you have to imagine Young Bucks now are putting their name back into the tag team title picture, the main focus, of course, of AEW. And I'm sure what their top goal was coming into AEW. Anyway, <clears throat> moving on from there. We go into our Casino Battle Royale. And it was a who's who field as we uh, started off, of course, with two participants. And then every three minutes, as the uh, clock count down, a suit of five participants basically uh, came out here. And we just had an all-out melee and brawl. The participants included Darby Allen, Lance Archer, Brian Cage, Ricky Starks, Eddie Kingston, The Blade, The Butcher, Phoenix, Pentagon L0M. Yes, went for a name change. Uh, Sean Spears, Austin Gunn, Billy Gunn, uh, Santana Ortiz, Jake Hager, Trent Chuck, Will Hobbs, and your number 21, that's I'm forgetting somebody, was Matt Seidel. It's funny because we haven't heard or seen Matt Seidel since, pff, golly, I can't even remember when. And apparently the humidity was really good, not only to everybody, but also to the ring as well, as Macedel immediately goes for a high-risk spot and slips. And I know people are bashing him for it, calling botch and all sorts of other stuff, but I give God credit for uh, trying. And anybody out there, again, who is facing that high weather, as someone who can't stand high humidity and goes full of evil, um, I can definitely relate to uh, what they were uh, going through. Anyway... <clears throat> As we uh, continue through uh, this match, there was some ridiculous spots and some very uh, surprising eliminations. And uh, basically, by the way, my favorite spot from the uh, Tuba Nail was that freaking dirty dancing uh, punch through the diploma straight into Reba's face. Reba, I think, was actually the MVP of that match. Her character and her acting, freaking brilliant. Oh, man, I freaking love it. So yeah, uh, they came out as Hager, Trent, Christopher Daniels, Ray Phoenix, and the Blade kicked us off. It was Kasarian, Will Hobbs, Chuck, Ortiz, and Santana in the next suit. And then Daniels and Blade were eliminated. Uh, Billy, Penta, Zero M, Brian Cage, Ricky Starks, Darby M, they came out next. We did get a hug because, again, you got to give the people what they want. I'm looking through uh, my notes now that my uh, phone's been working. Been weird power issues here, let me tell you. And uh, then we had Billy, Ray, and Chuck. They were all eliminated. We then had Sean Spears, Eddie Kingston, Butcher, Sonny Kiss, and Lance Archer come out. And basically, as soon as Lance Archer came out, I was like, game over. Sonny Kiss, Hager, eliminated immediately. Mastodel came out, and of course, we had that spot. And then our finals were Penta, or Santana, Ortiz, Trent, Kazan. They were all eliminated. Ricky Starts gets eliminated by Darby Allen. So clearly, they were not done with each other. But Darby Allen, he ends up suffering for his craft, which I'm sure, you know, he's used to. But this was uh, brutal, as Taz was on commentary during this, too. And literally, they pull out a body bag, which is, you know, a typical spot. But then they fill it up with tax, trap Darby Allen inside of it, and Brian Cage literally throws the tack-filled Darby Allen corpse-filled body bag out over the top rope onto the entranceway. Dear God, how is he alive? Damn. And that was the end of Darby Allen. So tell me, Darby Allen, Ricky Starks, they're nowhere done with each other, and maybe Team Taz and Team Assassin are not yet finished with Darby Allen. Ooh, fuck. Anyway, as the match continued, Sean Spears, he was eliminated, then Archer and Hobbs, they got into it. I love this feud. And in the end, Archer, he eliminates Hobbs and Cage off of a double drop kick after Hobbs and Cage were duking it out for a while. Both were stuck in the apron. Team Taz all eliminated. 
And it came down to Matt Seidel, Eddie Kingston, and Lance Archer. Matt Seidel, he gets eliminated. We're down to Eddie Kingston and Lance Archer. Uh, Jake tries to promote a distraction to Eddie Kingston. Uh, Blade and Butcher try to be the nervous makers to help Eddie win as Lance continues to be on the apron. In the end, Eddie gets thrown up the top rope. Lance Archer stays on the apron. Eddie, well, everybody literally died. Lance Archer wins. So Lance Archer will be our next challenger to the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. Um, there were some messy spots here in this Casino Battle Royale, but it was okay for the time that was allotted and with what, again, the situations that everyone was dealing with. And uh, I enjoyed it. Not bad. Not the best, but it was uh, fun to watch. And as far as Matt Seidel, I mean, who would have guessed that guy coming out of anywhere? I don't think his third eye opened at all during this match either. Whether or not we ever see him again at AEW, only time will tell. I mean, I'm still wondering where Christy James is, and she's one of the only independent talents with an actual win. Just saying. Anyway, after one human car wreck, we go to another human car wreck as we have Sammy Guevara taking on Matt Hardy in a Broken Rules match. This fan kicked up from the get-go with a uh, ghost from the past. Sammy's past, as Sammy was behind the wheel of a golf cart this time, running down Matt Hardy. In the end, Matt Hardy, of course, he outruns it. And then we're literally fighting in the comments area where that street fight originally began, where Sammy was first run over by a golf cart. Both these men proceed towards a table area, and they go up a scissors lift, and oh, dear God. They go up the scissors lift, in a horribly botched way where both men basically excel over the tables, hit the concrete, but Matt Hardy's head literally bounces off the concrete and Aubrey Edwards immediately holds this up as they try to fight and Hardy is literally slum over. Match should have been stopped, should have not been continued, and it seemed like it was going to be, but apparently on behest of Doc Samson and everybody else around, the match decided to continue, and they literally rushed towards the end spot, which I guess was supposed to be off of scaffolding. I thought Hart Hardy was going to fall off it. And literally, this was a messy, bad match. Should have not continued. Should have been just postponed, thrown out. Should have just gave Sammy the win. Should have just moved to Dynamite. In the end, though, Sammy falls off of scaffolding. He falls through some staging area and uh, can't answer a 10 count because it was last-minute standing rules. Uh, Matt Hardy wins. So much controversy, anger, grief, and discussion and debate came out just from this match alone when it came to the well-being of people because concussions are such a serious, real threat to anyone's mental and physical well-being and their life, really. And uh, Matt Hardy's wife, um, Rebby, did not leave her voice silent. And according to what I read, she and Matt will be on AEW Dynamite this week. Oh, Lord. Anyway, there's a lot I could say about this, but just listen to Jeff Meacham's thoughts. Go look at my friend Amy from WrestleJoy's Cliff Notes from Tony Khan's Post Media Scrum regarding this as well. Tony Khan's been trying to keep us updated constantly from this. Apparently, Hardy, he's been released from a hospital, took MRI, CAT scan, everything seems okay. And my Hardy confirmed he will be on Dynamite this Wednesday, and he will speak. So hopefully, we will get more on this come... Um, Wednesday Night Dynamite, but good lord, that was horribly scary. And it kind of changed the mood for the rest of the pay-per-view as I tried to focus to the point I had to rewatch this other half twice to really get into these matches. Boy, did I'm glad that I did that! Because the next match was Hikaru Shida vs. Funda Rosa, and this match was everything I expected to be, and honestly, probably was my match of the night. An absolute incredible effort and performance by Funda Rosa. Tegan the champ, move for move, counter for counter, even her chair step up Maneuver. Funda Rosa knew from the get-go had it mapped out and used it against Sheeta. Sheeta could not really get the better of Funda Rosa at all during this match. The only time she did was a Meteora off the stairs. Perfect, I might add. Just missing, crashing her knees into that step. Yeesh. And then literally as she pulls off the uh, Falcon Arrow face, she's done the deal. Not quite. Quick kick up of Funda Rosa and she smiles during it too. Funda Rosa loving this fight. Loving what she's in. She had uh, Hikaru Shida tied up in a number of submissions, working on uh, her legs. Constantly went for that Thunder Driver, could not do it. There was multiple knee strikes, but it wasn't until the knee strike with the momentum off the ropes at the very end finally gave close to 20 minutes of action, I might add. Hikaru Shida the win in probably her toughest match to date, and honestly, probably the best match in AEW women's history so far. Incredible title match. I would love to see Funda Rosa be a part of AEW. Be more involved in this. Clean finish, straight down the middle, pure classic women's professional wrestling and fight 
I absolutely love this match. Some cool spots in here included an innovative pendulum swing and then using the bomb turnbuckle, driving Sheeta's head into it. Very impressive. Very impressive strength shown by uh, Thunder Rosa as well. And again, it was a very well-paced and uh, balanced match. But that running knee strike, it proves lethal. And Hikaru Shida retained. But bravo to both ladies for an incredible match. All right. Uh, before we move on to more action, we go backstage with Alex Marvez, who has an announcement, apparently, from Kip Saban. Out of nowhere. This was apparently unscheduled. Apparently, Kip has got an announcement for us, but Ford basically takes over. Congratulations to the two. The super bad couple, officially, they're getting married. And apparently, we're going to learn the best man for Kip Sabian and Penelope for his wedding this Wednesday on Dynamite. So much speculation galore. Who could it possibly be? Who is on Kip Sabian's good side? Who has Kip Sabian worked with in the past? Who can AEW bring to really watch over this affair as it's being built? Some people say Mural. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, in English, be an interesting man. If nothing else, he could grace us with his lovely singing voice. Um, honestly, I don't have a damn clue. I really don't. I don't think it's Matt Seidel, so I'm super curious, and I'm sure there's a ton of speculation still about who literally is the best man for this wedding. So we'll have to wait and see. That is the announcement to come on AEW Dynamite. And we move on from there. We go into a match that seemed kind of out of place, but it was still good. Eight-man tag as the Dark Order took on the team of the Natural Nightmares, QT Marshall, Dustin Rhodes, with Allie. Hey, Allie. Uh, Matt Cardona and Scorpio Scott. Scott, Scott. And uh, this was a very competitive uh, eight-man tag. Uh, really, it was a proving ground match, I feel, mostly for Colt Cabana, who literally came out now sporting Dark Order colors. And um, it was some uh, great eight-man tag, but it looked like early on, Colt Cabana may have injured himself, and it kind of played throughout the match. Things really picked up, though, when Mr. Broy Lee became the difference maker, and they were basically destroying QT Marshall. It wasn't until a hot tag by Dustin where the match finally went into favor of the opposition. And then Scorpio Sky comes into play after Evil Uno and Stu Grayson. They put the match in, and they almost win it for the Dark Order. In the end, though, uh, Scorpio Sky and Mr. Broy Lee, they once again have another phase off. That's a TNT title match waiting to happen, folks. But who comes into play? Out of nowhere, by the way, who didn't come out with the Dark Order, the Queen Slayer. Newest member of the Dark Order, number 99, Anna J. But before she could do anything, we have a repeat of what happened last time. Randy Rhodes takes her out, and we have a screaming, vicious Jezebel and Anna J. Literally like a banshee being withheld back by Stu Grayson. Clearly, Anna J wants to rip Randy's head off. I hope she does, personally. But uh, we'll have to uh, wait and see when that picks up, as she was basically taken out of the match completely from that point on, and Randy wasn't seen anymore either. So, hey. Hey, I guess Allie's not so much being a threat here right now. Still wondering about that time match to come, and where's this tie stand as well? Anyway, as this match continues, it comes down to uh, Colt Cabana and Dustin, as it looked like Mr. Burley set up Dustin for the easy win pin once again for Colt Cabana. But Colt fails to capitalize on it. He goes for apparently a top rope maneuver, crashes and burns, and simple roll up. Dustin Rhodes gets the win on behalf of Cody, the Nightmare family, and more so himself. Five decades, still going strong. Big, massive win for, well, basically this hybrid nightmare family. And a uh, really good eight-man uh, tag action all around. It seemed that Mr. Broy Lee was extremely disappointed in Kukabuna. But it looks like Evil Uno right now is being the uh, voice of reason. But as I said, I don't think Kukabuna really fits in the Dark Order. Despite the fact he did use Mr. Broy Lee's type discus clothesline maneuver on a match on AEW Dark. Now, when he continue to do that... Is Evil Uno going to try and once again reprogram and continue with um, his training? I don't know where we go at this point. Anyway, but I do know what's come next. Because following that, and a great victory speech by Dustin, and basically saying, I'm nowhere near done, it was made official. Dustin Rose will now challenge Mr. Brody Lee this Wednesday on AEW Dynamite for the TNT Championship. This would be a huge win for Dustin and his illustrious career. And a huge blow to the Dark Order. I'm really looking forward uh, to this match. It should be a very physical affair. And I hope it personally is one-on-one. -on -one, but I feel there's going to be a lot more storyline type elements here. Between this big feud in the end. That is the Dark Order and the Natural Nightmares. Anyway. Moving on uh, from there. That's going to be a really good match. We go into AEW Tag Team Championship action. As... 
Hangman Adam Page and Kenny Omega, they defend the titles against FTR, the number one ranked tag team in AEW, and Cash Wheeler and Dax Harwood with Tully Blanchard at ringside. Very extremely competitive tag team match. Clash of styles galore. Really, Kenny Omega's legs, though, they were the basically the hindrance in this match as FTR truly worked them over to the point that he really couldn't establish the base for the one-wing angel. And at one point, he was literally limping and was in a two-on-one type affair at the hangman was taken out earlier. Hot tag by Heyman and Page. And literally, Heyman and Page, he basically puts the match into favor for his team. All the moves galore. Pulls off the buckshot lariat. Eventually, we got the chance pulling off the uh, last call. It was not enough. Things really broke down, though, towards the end when FTR capitalized on what made them great. No flips, just fists. And they literally pull off their version of the AEW Star Machine, because I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of it. And they thought they got the win here. Near fall. Incredible near fall moments in this match, too. Bang with the V-Trigger! And it looked like things were in favor, but again, the leg gave out the uh, Dax with the uh, chop lock. As we move towards the uh, end of the match, Heyman and Page, he is the illegal man, and he gets hit with not one, but two mind melders, you know, that uh, pile driver. And it looked like the second one was really, like, botchy or messy. Again, heat, humidity, close to the main corner. Uh, who knows what was uh, happening here. Um, anyway, as this uh, match continues... And I thought Omega was out, by the way. Uh, basically, Omega restrained enough after that second uh, assisted like power drive maneuver. And ladies and gentlemen, you have new, brand new, they've finally been dethroned, AEW Tag Team Champions. Oh, my goodness. And the miscommunication with the B-Trigger, the Page, and the Mind Breaker, that's what it was. And Page King out of that was an incredible uh, moment as well. But, uh, yeah, we got new tag team champions. It was a hell of a reign by Paige and Omega, 200 plus days, but it's over. But here's the thing that's most interesting about after the match. Omega with kind of a dazed look, grabbing like a ring end type table dealy. Um, just looking at it, looked like he was going to set up to hit uh, Paige with it, but he didn't. And basically, Paige, he just gets up, kind of like walks towards Omega, and Omega just lets him collapse. As Omega looks at this table and just drops it, I thought he was going to like assault him or something. No. Omega just walks away. Omega walks away. He meets the Bucks, Young Bucks backstage. And they're just chatting all the way to Omega, who basically is getting like an Escalade type van. He's like, nah, this is it. I need a clean start. Clean start. And he's just giving the Bucks basically all men a decision. As the Bucks seem uh, also hesitant on this too. Nobody knows what way the Elite's going on right now, but everything's about to change in the Elite. That's for sure. And damn you, rest of joy, for building that clip with that song. I had sand in my eye, but damn. Anyway, what is next now for the Elite? Paige is out of the Elite. Bucks feel reluctant about it. Bucks might challenge FTR for the titles. Where's Omega's head at? Is the cleaner coming? He did walk by a broom towards the van. And Omega riding off by himself. Will Omega show up this Wednesday on Dynamite? What's going to happen next? The elites, once again, at the forefront of AEW when it comes to the direction, what to expect, what's going to happen. Will BTE tell you anything? Uh, I'll tell you right now on the Jay Kilgriff Garrison, but that's another thing. Anyway, uh, I have no idea. And FTR, congratulations to them. Let's see how they redefine tag team wrestling in AEW in the most stacked, in-depth, dynamic tag team wrestling roster in professional wrestling. Well, anyway, <clears throat> moving on uh, from there. There's been a lot of different feeling, a lot of uh, debate, a lot of different type matches. It doesn't get more different than this. As we go into the Mimosa Mayhem match, Jericho vs. Cassidy 3. A match of Jericho's own design. He comes out, the fans, they sing Judas. And basically this match, it is pinfall submission or throw your opponent, literally, full body into one of the vats of Mimosa on each side of the ring. Everything came in play here, including Orange Cassidy's hair and the Mimosa. Both men have a single leg in the Mimosa. Well, uh, Jericho actually had a leg in the Mimosa. Uh, literally, uh, one leg was in the Mimosa. I thought I was going to like do a bouncing act fall in the Mimosa. The Mimosa came in here to play more than anything else, you can't tell. Aubrey Evans was the ref for this, too. I'm just glad her ref shirt and herself didn't get wet from this, as far as I know. Uh, ice buckets, platters, ice, pitchers of Mimosa, it all came into play here with some wrestling. As uh, we had some near spots where literally it looked like someone was going to be Mishinoku driver or just torture rack thrown into the mimosa. It was absolutely ridiculous. 
Orange Cassidy, though, he did try here. Got all the moves out. The Stun Dog Millionaire, the DVT. So many satellite DVTs during this show, too. Uh, just saying. As uh, well as, let's see, Chris Jericho got Cole Breaker. I thought he wanted here. Damn it, he did not. Pulls him into the uh, walls of Jericho. Cassidy gets a pitcher of mimosa. Burns Jericho. The fans are thrown into his face. And uh, in the end, as both these men are exhausted, Jericho's on the ropes. He eats one Orange Crush Superman punch. I think he does better than Roman. There, I said it. And literally, as Orange Cassidy looks on, he takes off the elbow pad. One more Orange Crush Superman punch, and Jericho gets flying off the top rope. And what a splash, by the way. I'm glad I was not in that splash zone, but boy, did those people ringside get their taste of mimosa. Man, Jericho splashes full on into the uh, left side vat of mimosa, if you're looking from the uh, runway. And, uh, yeah, Orange Cast, they won. So, I gotta imagine with Jericho just being happy being part of AEW, he's fine if he doesn't wrestle anymore, he says, and just do commentary, he's fine with this being it. Jericho has now put over Orange Cassidy, ladies and gentlemen. Where the hell do we go from here, I wonder? Especially with Orange Cassidy. Is he our future AEW World Heavyweight Champion? Maybe within the next two years, is he going to be the next TNT Champion? Is he going to even care or put more effort into any matches going forward like he did with this feud? I don't know, but if this was the end of this trilogy, I enjoyed the hell of it, despite the fact I got this match wrong. It was fun. It was different from everything else on the show. It was humorous. I enjoyed it. Uh, made me want to do a mimosa myself, even though I'm straight edge. Shout out to my friend Cindy G. Please follow us. Simply C underscore OK. Uh, give me a recipe for a virgin mimosa. And uh, I might uh, try that. But uh, again, uh, we'll see uh, what happens. But again, I thought the mimosa bat was going to come into play uh, afterwards. As we prepare for our uh, main event, we also learn, of course, the next pay-per-view will be AEW Full Gear. And as far as the Full Gear Challenge for me, we'll see what my annual physical says about this Friday. I have really been rethinking about a lot of stuff when it comes to my physical and mental well-being. My mental has always been a focal point. Maybe it's time to work a little bit on the physical, but we'll see. Anyway, our next pay-per-view, of course, will be AEW Full Gear to round out the year. I love the quarterly pay-per-view model, by the way. And that, of course, will happen uh, in November. I believe November 7th. So stay tuned for more details on that as we also approach AEW Dynamite's one-year anniversary. Uh, with that being said, the AEW champion will speak this Wednesday. We have Roy Lee versus Dustin for the TNT title. And Kip will introduce the best men for his wedding. And who knows what else might ensue this Wednesday on Dynamite. We'll have to wait and see. But there's still one more match we have to do before we talk about this Wednesday in Dynamite. As we come to our main event, as the man who says we deserve better has been campaigning to be your next AEW World Heavyweight Champion, Maxwell Jacob Friedman, MJF, the self-professed pro wrestling prodigy, takes on Moxley for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. One of these men was going to eat the first defeat of 2020 this year in singles action. This match was truly an MJF match. It wasn't just brawling. It wasn't just havoc around ringside. It was truly a focused, controlled match that really, he was out wrestling John Moxley. To the point John Moxley was getting so annoyed, he almost did the paradigm shift, which might I add, was banned in this match, and if he did it, would yield a disqualification and crown MJF as your new World Heavyweight Champion. By the way, for some reason, some fan out of nowhere apparently tried to uh, get to John Moxley, and uh, kudos to uh, security. Big fight filled with the intros, by the way, by uh, Justin Roberts, the perfect way to culminate your biggest match uh, of the night. Uh, anyway... <clears throat> MJF, he basically was really controlling this match, really working on uh, John Moxley's arm, obviously setting up for that uh, salt of the earth armbar submission type uh, finisher. And uh, there were some great uh, near pearl spots, great in ring psychology. When the match finally did go outside, though, John Moxley took full advantage of it, driving him through the uh, guardrails, literally out into the audience, pushing him through the guardrails on the uh, fan face side. But it wasn't until a wheelbarrow type suplex into the square corner steel ring post. Truly turned the match now in anyone's favor as MJF stood up from that and finally got into the ring with, well, simple as that, a crimson mask. And literally, this just turned to John Moxley's match following that. He sensed blood. He saw blood. He went after it. 
Things really picked up when John Moxley nearly got the win off a beautiful Gotch style pile driver. Casa Ninare! Shout out to the king. And uh, not enough, though. Literally, though, MJF, he was just being brutalized at this point. Literally, John Moxley taking, well, biting MJF's head out. You know, a little bit of a seat from what happened last week, Wednesday. As the uh, match continued, though, there was a uh, double stomp to the arm. MJF getting the match to his favor. As again, he tries to uh, weaken the arm. And uh, despite uh, what you say about MJF, he really was on his way to become a champion here. If he stuck to his game, he probably would have won, as John Moxley said on the post media scrum. But in the end, he tried to go for the 42 gate punch, but a miscommunication behind the rest back with the ring toss and the rest of the strap did. John Moxley saw the ring. MJF picked it up, but John Moxley saw what happened. Ref not looking. Double underhook DDT, the paradigm shift, or deck rag, whatever you call it that. And John Moxley retained. One, two, three. John Moxley is still our AEW World Heavyweight Champion in an incredible pro wrestling match. I was thoroughly impressed with this match, top to bottom. It really tested John Moxley from a psychology and a wrestling standpoint. And as John Moxley said, MJF definitely is a future champion. He wants to see this man hold this company down for the next 25 years. And in the end, I think he earned uh, John Moxley's respect, so kudos to him. But I feel like he and Wardlow are going to have some things to discuss following this. And as Renee put it, you'll get your time, kid. As again, we've had subtle, um, I guess you say Twitter beef between MJF and Renee. As Renee Sully put it, the better wrestler won. What an incredible main event. And John Moxley, you know what's next for you as Lance Archer watched from the crowd during this too. Next up, folks, it's John Moxley versus Lance Archer. An NJPW rivalry renewed. But this time, it's for the top gold, not for United States gold. Which, might I add, John Moxley is still our IWGP United States Heavyweight Champion. Ugh. With that being said, it was a wild pay-per-view. Some insane moments, some incredible wrestling all around. No match felt the same. A lot of uh, DDTs, though, will probably be my biggest thing here. And despite the heat, humidity, botches. Questionable uh, actions of one match, uh, progression aside, I really enjoyed AEW All Out. Would I say it was better than last year? Mm, maybe not, because, you know, it was the first one except the spend benchmark. Uh, but overall, if I were to say anything, go back. Rewatch the uh, buy-in. Watch Private Party versus The Dark Order. Uh, watch uh, Young Bucks versus Jurassic Express. Watch FTR versus Kim Omega and Heyman and Page. Watch Hikashi versus Fonda Rosa, which in my opinion was match of the night. And watch John Moxley versus MJF. So right there, you have five matches. One not even on the pay-per-view itself. Well, six. I almost forgot. Super Nail was a lot of fun, too. Five matches on the show and one before it. That's worth watching, in my opinion, no matter how much you have to pay for it, where you are, United States, UK, somewhere else in the world, too. This was a really fun, wild pay-per-view. I look forward to what's next in AEW. Speaking of which, we now know what is next to a degree. We have Mr. Broy Lee defending against Dustin Rhodes, and something tells me that Mr. Broy Lee will not be alone. Damn it. Uh, we'll wait and see what happens with that match and how this progresses the storyline between the Nightmare Family and the Dark Order and see who truly resides over AEW. With that being said, we also now know that Kip Sabian's best man will be announced. I truly don't have a single idea. It's got to be someone that's going to be a big, beefy-type bodyguard dude. It won't be Warlow. So, thinking about everybody on the uh, roster, bleh, even the independent stars, I got nothing. If y'all got an idea, I'd love to hear it. But again, Miro, in English, those will be the first two on my mind. It won't be Mr. Anderson. It'd be interesting if they pulled in somebody else from uh, NWA. I guess Eli Drake would be actually a good best man because he'd be one hell of a talker. But we're going to have to uh, wait and see on that. And uh, like Renee says, this is a man's game, babe. You'll get there one day. Imagine Renee Young showing up in AEW and MJF confronting her. Now that would be interesting. And MJF finally has a loss on his win-loss record. Guy imagine it's going to drop him out from the number one spot, too. I can't wait to see what the rankings are going to be. Uh, we also did get some other match announcements, though, for uh, AEW Dynamite this week, as Chris Jericho looks like he's not done. Let's show my on. Let's demo God. And uh, Jake Hager, they will take on the duo of Joey Janela and Sonny Kiss in a no-disqualification match. Now, clearly, Sonny Kiss, Joey Janela, they've been very effective as a tag team. Chris Jericho, Jake Hager, they're going to have some built-up animosity and frustration, and they're going to unleash hell on these two. 
And of course, when you're with the inner circle, you're never alone. So this is going to be a huge test for Sonic Kiss and Joey Janela. But we know Joey Janela, he is reckless. He will die for wrestling. We will see what sort of madness will ensue here. And we'll also see if his forehead healed from that last match too with that turnbuckle spot. And I feel like Orange Cassidy is not going to mess with Chris Jericho here. I feel like that feud's finally done, and so are those two with each other. You wonder, though, if that's going to come into play at all or pick up here psychologically for Chris Jericho. Will we see a different type of Chris Jericho, a distraught Chris Jericho, or a more dangerous Chris Jericho, where Floyd the baseball bat might really come into play? Only time will tell. And following that uh, as well, especially after events that occurred, we have the Lucha Brothers with Eddie Kingston, taking on Jurassic Express, Luchasaurus, and Jungle Boy. Now, this should be interesting, considering we have to now redefine the tag team division rankings, see who's next potentially challenge FTR. People probably figure at first it could be the Young Bucks, but hey, a big win for one of these two teams. Both of these are future tag team champions, in my opinion. Either one of these teams could lead this company, I feel like, as tag team champions. This should be a very interesting match. you got the Fast Furious style of the Lucha style with the Lucha Brothers. You got the very unique young wrestling background in Jungle Boy, and you got the all around incredible dynamism and dominance controlling changing factor in this match with Luchasaurus. If anyone's going to be a factor here, it's going to be Eddie Kingston. And if he's going to try and keep this five together for a plan to benefit him in the end, because clearly that was the plan of the Casino Battle Royal, it didn't work, he's going to have to help his Lucha brothers get the win here. It just makes me wonder if Butcher and Blade are going to get involved in this at all. And if they do, what other team on Jurassic Express's behalf might get involved in here too? And don't say Griff Garrison, all right? Ana Jay killed him. Just saying. Uh, with that being said, let me go ahead and shed some light on Dark as well. Ana Jay, once again, saying another statement of Brandon. You're watching at the Dark Star of the Dark Order. She destroyed uh, Skylar Moore. Uh, and Helico, he's really making waves as a single star. Will Hobbs, I feel, has huge potential to be part of AEW as he had his first win in AEW on uh, AEW Dark. Uh, Ricky Starks, once again, showing what he's about. Another uh, great win for uh, Team Taz. And, of course, more so, I watched Dark to just enjoy the banter and comical stylings among the two and wrestling uh, analysis of Excalibur and Taz, which might add to one of my best duels, favorite duels right now in professional wrestling. Anyway... Again, we already talked about the best man things to come. John Moxley's going to speak. I'm sure Lance Archer's going to confront him. We got to wonder what's next for the women's division now. Who could step into a car sheet at next? Chris Statlander, she's making waves, making progress, and getting better. I can't wait to see her return. We wonder if Big Swole's going to step up now to the plate. Is Britt Baker going to come out now and call out the champ and Big Swole? Could we get maybe a triple threat? Maybe no more contenders match? Uh, who knows at this point? And, of course, the last match, and I imagine this has to be an event. We have Mr. Broy Lee taking on Dustin Rhodes for the TNT Championship. Dustin, of course, doing this not only on behalf of the Nightmare family and his brother, but also for his own legacy. As again, he just brought out a shirt. Five decades earned. This guy is nowhere near done. Do not count out the natural. But as much as I hate to say it, I'm just looking at it from a story standpoint. Dark Warrior is going to do everything they can to win. And I'm sure Mr. Broy Lee is going to have Coca Ben out there to prove something to him, too. I feel like Mr. Broy Lee is going to get the win here. And uh, with that being said, that's really all I have to say for now on uh, AEW, AEW All Out, Dynamite, Dark, and all things AEW. As we truly wonder, the biggest thing right now, what is next for the Elite? Will further details come to fruition and reality come tomorrow night on Dynamite as I come to you Tuesday night, September 8th? Only time will tell. But I am done here for now. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to know more about me, know this. I am just a simple man and a lifelong fan of dot, 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 wrestling. Twitter, Instagram, PlayStation. It's N Foster in 1916. YouTube channel, youtube.com, user forward slash Noah Foster 210. As always, support and pair of at the Harvard folks. Support NoDQ, support WrestleJoy, for wrestling discussions, Team All Elite, join the Dark Order. Yes, I lost. Congratulations, Sean. I damn sure don't have to lie at you. Damn sure don't control me. And as always, I'd like to close. Support wrestling always begins small. Let's keep going. It's incredible, diverse, unique, elite, authentic, unscripted, unrestricted. Wrestling community together. Simple as that. With that being said, thank you so much for tuning in. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, tell a friend. Uh, hit the bell on all vehicles on this channel. Hit subscribe and help me grow this channel. Shout out to all 160 of you. That's moving on this fun YouTube creator's journey. Next content coming up includes a simple take so far on New Japan Road as 
mere hours away, we finally will review our blocks and participants to G1 Climax 30. I could not be more excited. But I am done here for now, so until next time, take care, enjoy life. Tomorrow's never guaranteed. Treasure your families. Enjoy wrestling. Enjoy the Dark Order. And uh, until the next video, just as always, support one another, support each other, treat each other fairly, and I just hope you all have a good night. Simple as that.